And so again, this is where Calvinists will hyper-focus on one section of the text in order to support their doctrine and ignore the rest of it. Some people think that John 17 is kind of a slam dunk for Calvinism. And um, as, as with most hermeneutical uh, issues, uh, typically you can just say, uh, keep reading <laughs> when it comes to some of those issues, because when it comes to John 17, some Calvinists just stop reading way too soon. Uh, and that, that is part of the problem. Uh, so while I'm watching for your questions here, let me, uh, let me bring that up on the screen. Uh, we'll just begin there in verse six. Uh, I have revealed to you, to those whom you gave me out of the world, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. They know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I have gave them the words that you gave me, and they accepted them. Now, who is he talking about that he has given the words to? Okay. Does he give those words to everybody indiscriminately that are believers? Or is he specifically talking about his apostles here? I think it's pretty clear. I think he's talking about the disciples. Um, and so they, they're the ones that have been given to the Father, I mean, given to the Son by the Father. They've given me out of the world. These are the ones I'm giving my word to. Uh, in fact, um, if you look at Acts 10, you hear, you see uh, uh, Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter addressing this. Um, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God appointed him to be uh, with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing and good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We were we were our witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. So he's talking about eyewitnesses, okay? They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. So he's testifying to the crucifixion, as he should as an apostle, obviously. God raised him from the dead. Oops. I don't know what I did there. Um, God raised him from the dead on the third day and granted that he become visible. Okay. Not to all the people. So he, he didn't visually re um, reveal himself to all the people, but he gave himself or showed himself to witnesses who were what? chosen beforehand by God. Here's an election of God right here. Now, is this election of certain individuals to the neglect of all the other individuals? No, this is, I've elected these individuals to be the mouthpiece or the witnesses to be a blessing to all the other individuals. So when, when Calvinists hear the word election, they typically automatically think, oh, these people were chosen to the neglect of everybody else. These individuals were chosen for salvation and everybody else passed for damnation. That's kind of the way their mind works because that's the way they've been trained to think that way. Okay. Stop thinking that way, <laughs> okay? Start thinking, when you hear the word chosen, think, oh, these people were chosen to be a blessing to the rest, okay? Like with my children I've talked about before. If I pick my daughter to bring to all of my children a dessert, I'm not choosing her to the neglect of her brothers. I'm choosing her to be a blessing to her brothers. See the, the difference? God chose Israel to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, according to Genesis 12, 3. He didn't choose Israel to be to neglect all the nations of the other, other earth. He chose Israel to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. God chooses messengers. Why? To be a blessing to all the people of the earth, not to, to neglect all the people of the earth. Okay. So understand that. Okay. So these were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly testify that this is the one who had been appointed by God as the judge of the living and the dead. So who does he give the words to? To testify, who does he give these truths to? This is what John, the priestly prayer is all about. He he was given to them out of the world. I gave them the words that you gave me. They accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you. Now, why, why did they know with certainty that he came from them? He walks on water, heals the blind. He does all these things in front of them, speaks parabolic languages, yes. But then he comes back to them and he says, here's what I mean by that. Here's what I'm saying to you. Here's what I'm teaching. You'll understand this more in the future when, when time is fulfilled and my purpose is fulfilled. But these people know for certainty because God is revealing to them who his Messiah is. And he uses means to do that, obviously. And those means means up. And they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. 
I am not praying for the world. Now, some Calvinists will just pull that right out of the context and go, look, 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 see, that's that's Calvinism 101 right there. I am praying for my specially chosen elect people. And this is what this is why it's so ironic to me that Calvinists will rec- accuse us of being man-centered when they read egotistically read themselves into verse nine right here. Because what they're ultimately doing is saying, God is Jesus is praying for me personally right here. Jesus is praying for me specifically. I am praying for latent flowers. I am not praying for the rest of those reprobates out there, but I am praying for latent. Man, that feels good. Oh man, that, that's kind of latent centered. I kind of like that. I kind of like Jesus praying for latent and not those reprobates out there. Man, that feels good. Whew, that's kind of man centered, isn't it? See how I can do that? I can do the same thing to you, Calvinists, that you're trying to do to us by calling it man centered, ego centered, elect centered, if you will, and saying, oh, it's just all about me. It's just all about me. God's praying for me here, not praying for those unelect reprobates out there, those people whose lives don't really matter. He's he's praying for the lives that just matter, the real lives that matter. He is praying, he is praying for those select people. Pick for reasons we don't know about. It's just that's left up to him. He'll 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 tell us one day what it, the reasons were, but we just don't know what those are. But he picked me, and he's praying for me there now. That that's an egotistic reading of this text because it's clear. I think from this text, he's praying for the twelve. <laughs> Read what else he goes on to say. But for those you have given me, that's what he's talking about. Those you've given me, they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And the glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer. So he's clearly speaking contextually about where he is right now, down from heaven on the earth with his apostles. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father, to protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one. So this proves right here, he's talking about his 12, because look what he says, none has been lost. So none of what has been lost? None of the people I've just been speaking about. The apostles has been lost, except, except there's one doomed to destruction. The scriptures would be fulfilled. Now, we've had other episodes where we've talked about the fate of Judas. Um, I believe that's accomplished through his omniscience. God knew which one would rebel against him, not God causally determined which one would rebel against him. Okay, there's a difference between knowing and causing. Some people don't see the difference between those two philosophically. We've gone over that in other episodes. This is not what we're talking about today. There's a difference between knowing something beforehand and determining something beforehand. We believe God is omniscience. Uh, God has omniscience, not that God is omnideterministic. There's a difference between uh, omniscience and omnideterminism. Omnideterminism is God causes everything to happen. Omniscience means God knows all things that are going to happen. There's a difference. You can't conflate those two and make them into one. Okay. I'm coming to you, Jesus says now, but I said these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word. So who, who does he give his word to, if not his apostles? I've given them your word. And the world has hated them. What happens to the apostles? Like all of them almost, except maybe one, were, were martyred, killed for their faith. The world's hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Now, obviously, the world is speaking of the unbelieving world, because obviously it's not the believing world who hated and killed them. But in general... Speaking, the world, uh, the unbelieving world, hated my messengers and they killed them just like they did to me. Okay. Um, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself. Now, who is, who did Jesus? commend and send into the world. Who did Jesus do that for? Every single one of us or for the apostles while down from heaven? I think it's clear. This is this is talking about apostolic authority, his prayer for the apostles. His prayer is not just for them, but for, for many others. Chris uh, McFadden, thank you so much for your donation. Um, and I appreciate your, 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 uh, your words there and appreciate you supporting on Patreon. I really do uh, thank you for that. That means a lot. Uh, and we couldn't do this. I, honestly, I, I wouldn't have been able to, to afford to continue to do this if not for the support uh, of our patrons. And so thank you guys for for helping make this happen. Um, now, look at the verse. Look, look at what it, it continues to say. I'm making this bigger so you can really, really see it. Okay. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified 
And this chapter divisions here, remember that's not orig an original text, it's added, okay? Obviously the verses are added to, but he continues in that same prayer. My prayer is not for them alone. In other words, I'm not just praying for my apostles. Who else am I praying for? I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Now notice it doesn't say, I pray causally affecting certain people to believe in their message because I've chosen them too, or something of that nature, okay? He's saying, I pray for those who are going to believe through their message. I pray, what, what does he pray for them? That all of them may be one too, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world, so that what? So that the world may be reprobate and um, go to hell because I don't really care about the rest of the world. I just care about those that um, the, the, the messengers and I just care about those who believe in their message and the world can go to hell. Because, and I know Calvinists wouldn't put it that bluntly, but that's, that's what their system is ultimately saying. But look what Jesus says. May they also be in us. Why, 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 why does he want the, the believing ones, the church to be one and united as one under Christ and to bring this message? Why? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. In other words, the prayer in John chapter 17, when he says, I don't pray for the world, when he first starts off there and praying for his apostles, doesn't mean that he doesn't go on to pray for the world later. And so again, this is where Calvinists will hyper-focus on one section of the text in order to support their doctrine and ignore the rest of it. And we'll just say, keep reading, brothers. Yes, yes, earlier he says, I pray for them. I don't pray for the world. That's because he was specifically focusing on his apostles right then. Then he goes on to pray for those who will believe through their message. And why does he pray for all who will believe? So that the world may be blessed. In other words, it's not about God choosing certain people to the neglect of others. It's about God choosing people to be a blessing to others so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought into complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Um, again, this is an inclusive kind of prayer, not an exclusive kind of prayer. This is about the, the God bringing a message of hope to the world, uh, not about God uh, neglecting people uh, for his own glory or um, just picking certain people out and passing by others or something of that nature. That's just not anywhere seen in the pages of scriptures as, as far as I can tell. 